so while we wait for the first uh, uh, visitor to, to, to join uh, the call, uh, I would like to present a little bit what we're doing. Uh, there's a few days to commencement, so you're, you're almost there. It's kind of a very exciting moment. And it's the moment also, oh, Charles, how are you? Ex oh, you're mute, yeah. Hello, how are you? <laughs> We're super happy to, to be here with you, Charles. What fancy room you're in? What is that round room with columns? Yeah, it's like the, yeah, it's like the Oval uh, Office, actually. This is my apartment. Oh, God, I'd so much rather have you in the Oval Office than what, <laughs> who we have in the Oval Office. <laughs> yes, so. yes. Well, I don't know, I don't know. I, yeah, but, yeah. Well, it's great to have you here, Charles. I mean, you don't need introduction. Everyone knows you. Uh, you're behind many of the most important things that have happened, not only to architecture in the last years, but also to the city of New York and to other places like Fire Island and many other places. Uh, we're really happy uh, to be here with you. And uh, all these bunch of people that you see here, uh, they will be having their commencement this weekend, this Saturday. So it's the oh, perfect wow. moment to have a discussion with you and to know more about how were your basically the moments that you left the school and, and started your own career, su such an exciting one that we all enjoy. So you have the mic. Uh, well, thank you. Um, th um, thank you, Andres. It's really wonderful to, to be with you all. This is the first time I've joined a class at Columbia in quite some time. I used to teach there. Um, and I used to be invited to, to uh, end of term crits. I don't know what happened, but um, uh, anyway, uh, I do miss, I miss, uh, miss the school up there and uh, I, I still teach at SBA. Um, I, I invented a course that's on um, the bridge between art spaces and architecture. And it's, uh, um, it's called, um, the re redefined space of art or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, because our, our practice, as, as you all know, our practice is, uh, is a multidisciplinary practice. And we, um, we started as an art studio, meaning Liz and Rick started doing work using their credit card to do things that were counter to the institution of architecture, which they had thought had sold out. They were, they didn't want to participate in the kind of uh, 80s uh, crass commercial architecture world, um, you know, right after Liz got out of school. Uh, and rather, they started funding their own work. And their work um, was always uh, architectural in nature, but, uh, but more importantly, I think it was cultural in nature. And I think our practice has always been about uh, thinking deeply about culture. Um, and what that means um, in terms of space and building, but also in terms of theater and, um, and dance and opera and, um, and our public space. Um, what are, what are those, those things that we, we negotiate uh, through design um, that impact the world of culture every day? Um, and so that curiosity, sort of that, working on the outsides of the business uh, combined with the curiosity um, of uh, interrogation about our culture and, and what makes us tick is the same thing that drives our uh, architecture practice now. Um, our practice has grown. Um, when I started with Liz and Rick in 97, I was only three years out of Columbia. Yeah, I graduated in 94. Five, 94, I don't remember. But um, uh, I was three years out of Columbia. I had started my own practice, um, and but it was a fledgling, pretty typical New York City practice. Uh, I was doing gallery spaces, retail spaces, uh, apartments, and some freestanding work out of the city. Um, and I'm, I have to mention, just per personally, I started... Uh, my professional career before Columbia in New York with Smith Miller and Hawkinson. I was there for four years and I have to give a lot of credit to Henry Smith Miller and Laurie Hawkinson who um, taught me how to make things. Uh, during that four year stint, I, uh, I, I learned how to make a full set of drawings. There were only six of us in the studio. I became an associate 
at the age of 27 and um, uh, drew an entire set of drawings by myself for a gallery in Brooklyn called the Rotunda Gallery, which I think it still might be there. Um, and I also designed and built by hand my own loft. Um, I did all the plumbing and the electric and I made the doors and I made, of course, it, because it's me uh, and, and Smith Miller and Hawkinson influence too, I made a giant door that was 30 feet long and I it rolled on a, on a, um, um, a, a track. Uh, and I made all that stuff myself. I can't forget the day that I took the wedges out from underneath the 30 foot door um, and the whole thing didn't fall down and it actually moved. I was so thrilled and I was like, fuck it, I know how to be an architect. Um, and um, so I think, I know that you wanna hear about being an architect in the world. And I think the first the first lesson for me came from, in, from that period, which is, um, learn how to make something and make it um, yourself. And that makes you understand physics and materials and tools. And then you have empathy for the people that you're gonna be working with. Um, it doesn't matter how small in a way or how, how big it, you know, uh, the thing is. Um, but making something is such a great way to learn something. Um, anyway, and getting back to, and so I had that four year stint and then I went to Columbia to the AAD program, which I really loved. I thought it was fantastic. It's very short. Um, and I know it's a cash cow and it was there to generate tons of money, uh, for the school, but it also made a whole bunch of great architects. I mean, out of my class, Greg Pascarelli, um, uh, Lynn Rice, um, uh, gosh, a whole bunch of really si significant architects emerged from my class and the surrounding classes. Um, and so I was thrilled uh, with that. Um, I joined Liz and Rick. So I, I founded my own little practice and I was doing things for myself uh, that were like, or I was doing things for other people like I was doing for myself, that, that loft that I made for myself. And it wasn't that it was unfulfilling and it wasn't that I knew it w couldn't go somewhere. I knew it could, and it was. I was already starting to work in the art world and, um, and things like that. But Liz and Rick uh, offered, they, they heard that I was good and they offered to have me come in and do uh, design with them and uh, manage uh, the Brasserie restaurant, which was, their very first uh, permanent piece of architecture in New York City, and they entrusted me with that. Um, and so it, it was a, a scale I felt very comfortable with, um, and I didn't really know Liz and Rick that well. Uh, I knew them from my undergraduate years as the, as the pretentious ones from New York. Um, and no, I'm joking, uh, but they, they, were, they were smarty pants, and, um, uh, I was like, oh, gosh, you know, I just want to go out and build. Um, anyway, so, but the combination really worked, you know, somehow um, that, that I kind of knew the nuts and bolts of doing, doing these things and, um, and that Liz, Liz and Rick were, were thinkers sort of outside the field. Um, when we got together, um, the synergy was really palpable. It was, it was, in immediate, it was immediate in, in two weeks. We, we were, Liz and I were drawing each other's drawings within two weeks and uh, we designed the brasserie and we came with a blur building together. Um, we did the brasserie, we, we did the ICA, uh, our I-beam uh, uh, competition. At any rate, I had started as a freelancer there because I kept my practice going. And then pretty soon I was like, huh, these projects I'm working on with Liz and Rick are kind of exciting and big and you know around the world and so I gave up my practice I finished my last job gave up my practice and joined them as a partner um, which is sort of how I came to be there um, and uh, so and that was it's been you know great ever since we we're doing projects around the world we have 110 employees I'm sure you know people there in fact I know Kevin Kennan uh, wanted me to send a shout out to one of you, I forget whom, but um, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of people uh, from Columbia. They're some of our favorites. Um, and um, 
And if we start hiring again, I'm sure you're, you can send in your resumes. Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit uh, about COVID and like what, what we think is, what we think the future is. Um, but I, but I want to say something specific to your generation, which is we find that you guys come out of school with incredibly broad skill sets. Um, uh, you know, all the modeling programs and all the digital software and all of these things are really wonderful. And I think most of you uh, come out uh, with a great head on your shoulders, you know, kind of can think through a problem, but can also problematize a problem to actually, what is the thing you're trying to do? Problem, problematizing it. Um, and, and that's, you know, when you're trying to, to be a creative professional, we are always trying to solve a problem, even if it's not a problem that a client gives us. It's our own problem. What are we trying to do? Um, that's super key. Um, but so, but getting back to, to the kind of current generation of graduates, the other thing we find, and this is a little bit of a critique, and I'm just gonna put it out there and we can have an open conversation in a little bit about this. The other thing that I find is that um, your generation uh, has been exposed to so much so quickly and knows so much, there's a, a sense of impatience uh, about when you're, you're, you should be given things to do. Architecture is still an old fashioned craft. Even though tools have advanced a lot and we can make many things with um, digital printing and all kinds of uh, computer assisted fabrication programs, it is still a craft. It still requires that you learn uh, on the job learning uh, all the different parts and pieces of, of making a building, of communicating with a client, of talking to engineers, of um, learning how to build a professional model, um, of knowing how to sketch uh, on a piece of paper with your own hand an idea that's in your head that you can convey immediately and with clarity and vision. These are skills that, that you must have and you must, if you don't have them right now, you have to develop them. It doesn't, doesn't come, it's, it's not right away. You're not gonna be you know, a principal at a firm in, in a year. I wasn't either, by the way. It took me 10 years of work in New York before I became a partner. Um, and it was hard work. I was, as I said, I was doing my own plumbing. I electrocuted myself. I closed the tools. I, I, I closed the sheetrock on the ceiling with all my tools uh, above the sheetrock and had to take the whole ceiling down. Um, you learn and you can't be afraid to make mistakes and you can't expect it all right away. Um, and so I think what my, my biggest advice to people leaving now is to not, to, to, to have patience and, um, but also to take advantage of every single task and know that there's something to be learned from everything you do that you'll put into effect um, down the road. So, you know, I know that some jobs are icky um, sounding but they're all important, you know? So um, just keep that in mind as you come and work for us. Now, um, I know I wanna leave uh, a good chunk of time for some Q&A, so I'm, I'm gonna speak for a bit longer uh, and then we'll open up uh, the call to all of you. I, I think there are 60, how many of 60, 76, that's really wonderful. Um, so um, recently, as you know, um, the world has changed. Um, you're all sitting in your own spaces, some of which are quite beautiful. Oh my God, somebody's in the Judd Foundation building. Um, who is that? Okay. Uh, uh, any, oh, I love seeing these backgrounds. It's really cool. Um, so it's, this, this thing has impacted everyone, everything, of course, as you know. Um, we are lucky that our work has generally continued. Um, and we're working from home. Um, it's nonstop. It's Zoom all the time. It's a little exhausting, but we're managing to, to do it. Um, we've actually had a huge success last week. We got a new project that was entirely uh, pitched for and won and, and the contract made all over Zoom. Um, 
and uh, or actually it was a different program, but whatever, same difference. Um, and that was surprising to all of us. We hadn't been to the site. Uh, we hadn't met the client in person, hadn't touched their hand, shaken their hand. Um, and so all of this happened uh, over Zoom. And I, I, it's like, it's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, um, it's, it's great that we have alternative business practices that we can, that we're, we can be much more flexible. Um, we can be anywhere and work together, which is very interesting. Um, we've started hiring West Coast people, European people. Um, well, we had hired those before the crisis, but now it does, they feel like they're with us the same as anybody else. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I suspect that our projects in particular are going to be impacted uh, in the long term because they're almost all dependent on public gathering. This is our passion, is, the, is the, the general public and making work for the public. So in my opinion, a city in which social distancing is built into the architecture is not a city I want to be in. Uh, it's not a city at all. Uh, so in, I think instead of changing our architecture, we should be changing our healthcare system. Um, and we should be conquering these illnesses as they crop up very quickly because they will continue to crop up clearly. Um, but I, for one, am very, I, I'm not interested in, in not having cities. I'm not interested in not being with people. I'm not interested in not going to the pines and having a tea dance. I'm not interested in um, going to virtual performances all the time. I'm not interested in an uh, auditorium that has three people, one person per three seats. Not interesting, yawn, boring, and the end of humanity, in my opinion. So I think we need to all work to make the world work again. We do need to be thoughtful about these kinds of pandemics. They will happen again. Um, and in terms of your careers, uh, getting out during this time is going to be tricky. But I, I use the illustration of getting a job without meeting as an example of encouragement um, that it is possible. And, um, and I know that there are some firms hiring. And in fact, if just one more of our jobs that went on hold starts up, we'll also be rehiring again, I suspect. So um, it's not all doom and gloom. It's just weird, plain weird. Um, I'm, you know, I sit here and I draw drawings all day long. And then I'm very old fashioned. I draw these drawings on sketch form and I photograph them and I send, don't take picture of that, by the way, that's a that's confidential project. Uh, I photograph them and I send them out to my partners and they sketch on them. It's very labor intensive. You know, it's, um, it takes a long time, lots longer than it does to be together. So I, we're all wishing for that, uh, that moment to happen. Um, and then one thing I'll just say, and then I'm going to open up for, for questions is, I think there are really interesting opportunities um, that are going to come about because of this. And it's not redes redesigning public space for social distance or rethinking public gathering necessarily. I think there will be advantages. There will be new type, new forms of gathering and new forms of entertainment that we will adopt and they'll become part of the part of, part of our normal. But we're not going to give up on the old forms either. Uh, they may shrink. I bet they're going to shrink. I have a feeling they're going to shrink. But so we have to deal with those. But I think one of the things that's in, in irrevoc been irrevocably changed is the workplace. The workplace is going to shrink. They, we are going to lose office space by half, I predict. And why? Because we don't need to be together all the time. We've, we've, done, we've proven that we don't. There's, we don't need to be together all the time. So offices are going to start shrinking. What's the opportunity? Housing. What has to be done? People have to work at a policy level. I'm just talking to you about those of you that might be thinking about getting going into different sides side places, and mar um, related but marginal parts, of, marginal is a bad word, um, ally, diff but different than architecture. Uh, people could start working in policy uh, to change code and zoning and 
uh, to and 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 design being uh, being uh, conscious of uh, how to convert office buildings that have fat floor plates into com to mixed use residential office buildings. How does that? How can that work? How can we add cores? How do we? How do we? Uh, and how do we make that those those um, those residential pieces affordable? Uh, because as we all know, one of the reasons New York uh, has been uh, losing its artists and its creatives and its um, you know poor people is it's just too expensive and there's not enough housing to to um, to to put these people up affordably. So um, the glut of office space it seems to me like an obvious place for architects, engineers, policymakers uh, to be putting energy into thinking about conversion to housing. So that's just a little tidbit of advice. Um, take that. Uh, I don't even need a commission when you make that super successful, but um, it's a good idea. Um, Andre, Andres, I'm going to just open up to questions. Yeah. I think we've got about 15 minutes, so. Amazing. Uh, so much material. I'm sure there will be. Please, Jan. Sharing your thoughts and questions. Hi everyone, um, please re-mute yourself if you're not speaking, but you do have the possibility to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Don't everybody jump at once. Okay, I'm going to have to go ahead and mute everyone. <laughs> you were talking about art and spaces of gathering. Uh, I wonder what's the way that uh, you would imagine the places that basically you've been working on and universities also evolving. Like, like universities are a huge thing and we're discussing, Charles, what would be the, the evolution of that? How do you see that uh, having been involved in so many kind of experimental uh, university buildings? Are you asking specifically about our current coronavirus age? Is that the question? Yeah, in general, yeah. and how, and, yeah. and kind of all the changes that you're seeing. Yeah. So we're working remotely now. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I like I said. I mean, I, I suppose I'm a little bit of a luddite in that I don't really want to believe that this this virus will require us to rethink our public spaces or being together. I, I just don't. I I'd like to not think that, but. But clearly, it's made a whole bunch of opportunities avail themselves. I'm sort of a positivist that way because I do think that um, the way we're we're working right now on this call is a brand new feature of this time, and it's not all bad. It's actually kind of got a good aspect to it. Um, if if we can't, you know, if we can't gather, I mean, I, I just can't think of the consequences. If we can't gather in groups, if, if, if artists and performers and entertainers and sports people, I mean, I, even them, if we can't get together, then the entire economy really is doomed. Uh, and like the world does fall into another, a new middle ages, honestly, you know? So um, I'm, I'm really holding out for some vac for a vaccine. Um, but I also think we can hold on to some of the things that have happened here. So I'll just say for a, a couple of things, since nobody's asking questions, if you want to ask a question, just jump in. But um, one thing I think that's going to happen is the performing arts venue. Oh, wait, I've got some, hold on. I've got chats here. I can look here. Should we do, 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 unmute yourself and ask? Hi, okay. Um, <clears throat> I think that the performing arts centers that we're working on right now, um, uh, in particular, we're doing an opera house for 2,300 people in China. Um, I believe that those spaces are going to shrink by a half. That, that, that there will be gathering. There will be, there, it will be just like it was. Um, but that there won't be the demand to be there all together the same way as there had been in the past. Um, there will be the demand to build in technology into those spaces uh, so that they can capture, um, you know, they can capture what's going on and broadcast them live 
to ticketed people, but with really high quality sound and vi video so that people do feel that they can be there. And one thing that's fantastic about that is the dem democratization of the performing arts. I actually think that, that this might be a way for people to watch a Metropolitan Opera production with great sound, uh, and that they've already done this a little bit, in their own home in like, in like La Paz, Bolivia for $5. And you know, at the same time, somebody in Sydney, Australia is doing it. They stayed up really late um, or got up really early and they're paying $5. And so the audience is tremendously expanded, but the ticket price has dropped a lot. And somehow there's a balance that lets the Met take, the, take home the same amount of money it needs to pay its staff and uh, artists. So I think there will be sort of new um, kind of rebalancing, um, but I can tell you, I am not going to design a hall uh, that spaces people six feet apart from each other. That, that isn't a hall for me. I, I will we'll, we'll give up on that kind of performance. Um, you know, we'll do, we'll do mile long operas or something uh, that's, that's different from its, from its inception, you know, that, that space it, you know, that, puts people outside. There's an article today about that, um, by the way. So it's interesting to read about the way we're gonna get through this interim time um, and, and still make money. So it's not all bad. I think actually there's a lot of expansion that can make the arts more accessible uh, and affordable. So any questions yet? We have one question um, okay. being asked, have you already had clients who are asking you to adjust designs in process um, in response to the pandemic? How have you, what have you been hearing from clients about this so far? Um, so far, no. Um, I think it's so early and we don't even, you know, we, there, there's a lot, there's 150 va vaccine trials underway around the world, 150. There's there chances, you know, the, the D diseases have been controlled and conquered. So I think most of our clients, um, since they're in performing arts and uh, visual arts, they, they don't want to think about a difference to the business model because when they tell, when they give us an instru instruction, do something differently on a, a fixed piece of architecture, they are instructing, they're telling themselves that they're going to have a change to their business model. And I don't think that they're yet dealing with that. Uh, and they are not wanting to construct things into the architecture that are, that are permanent. On the other hand, uh, I think we we will, I think have have to think about things about like, well, how do people queue up to get into this hall? Maybe we should think differently about that so that in the future, if we do have another one of these, we can make it a little bit safer. But I, you know, I just don't think anybody's going to go into a hall that is half full and ever feel anything but grief and um, and sadness. So that is not something you know that I, you know I'd like to, to to think about. So changing the having a client change the criteria by which we're designing their project would probably mean jettisoning the project and rethinking from scratch the way their their business model and their their content. Uh, is delivered. Uh, next question. I hope that helped. I don't know who asked that. Dexter. Oh, Leslie. And there's one from Dexter right now? Yeah, Dexter has one. What kind of adjustments in terms of updating building codes to enhance our resiliency as future public health response? Yeah, I mean, this this one probably is something that will be developed uh, more um, in terms of uh, probably first and foremost um, air recycle air um, exchanges in the uh, MEP system. Um, uh, that's that's going to be uh, made much more robust. There's going to be crazy filters on the machines. They're going to be pushing air faster. Uh, or changing air faster, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the some of the technological developments that are in the works are virus killers, airborne virus killers, uh, that that in in essence don't just trap viruses, but they literally kill them. Um, I don't know how with Clorox. Um, 
No, but uh, it, that you swallow. Uh, anyway, um, I think there'll be a lot of things that will get applied that it will be invisible. Um, I think I think that's what you're going to see mostly. Uh, I think all, every bathroom from now. I mean, I, I just told my my people at my office to change all the fixtures in our bathrooms to touch free. We we had previously had to touch them, um, and so that's happening even before we get back into the studio. Uh, things so that'll happen. Um, you know, uh, I I there there might be you know little things like having a health room at the entrance to each um, office, you know, where people can get uh, tests run um, and wait, wait it out. I mean, I think probably in the next little bit, before we all get back to work, we're gonna be having, we'll have tests at our office front door and there'll be 15 minute tests and um, people will be required to get tested once a week or something like that. Uh, and, you know, of course, positive people will be pulled, pulled out. This is, you know, this is, how we're going to manage coming back together. But the other thing is we're probably not all going to come back together again. You know, I think that that's really going to happen. And, um, you know, so other code things, you know, just following on that is they may increase the area, uh, per, uh, occupant of, uh, office space and by code, you know, what, what, what you're designing to might, might happen in restaurants as well. Um, although, uh, yeah, so um, there may be some things like that that happen, but my sense is that mostly it will be slightly invisible uh, things um, that will make us all feel more comfortable um, being together. I want to be together. I miss people. I miss bodies. Mm -hmm. I miss warm flesh. I miss <laughs> hugging people. Um, it's bad. So... This is actually a great segue question. Um, the last question for you, Charles. Okay. Is, do you think that um, offices are going to start hiring designers who live in different countries and yeah. allowing them to work remotely more permanently? Yeah, I think that I sort of alluded to that earlier. Um, I think I think it's true. I think we're it, it, the the idea of employment um, and and geography has really been thrown in its head. Um, and I think that's an opportunity, that, a good opportunity, opportunity. Um, you know, one of the great things about what's happened is I'm not getting on a plane. I used to get on a plane twice a week. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, I haven't gone on a plane at, as, as probably most of you haven't, uh, for almost three months now. Um, and there's actually no need. Our clients that used to demand that we fly overseas for a for a one hour meeting in Paris. I went to Paris on March 1st for a one hour meeting with my last big trip, um, which is dumb and just terrible for the environment. And um, it's the same thing that let, will let us hire people from other places and bring them in and, and make, us, make them feel part of the team. Um, I, I, don't, I think our technology is behind you know, this a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I want to have bigger pictures of people. I want to feel like there's sort of, in, you're in the same air, I suppose. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's still too distant. You're, everybody's on a screen. And so there could be advancements of technology that make us feel more comfortable with people being in faraway places. But we have, we have uh, two employees in Europe, one in Australia and one in, San, in Los Angeles. And I know that, um, it had always been a struggle for us to think that they could be fully engaged because we thought they needed to be with us. Mm -hmm. But guess what? They're working just as hard as anyone doing as consequential of work now as anyone in the studio. Um, and it just doesn't matter. So the answer to the question is, I think so. I think offices are going to start getting shaken up a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and it's kind of an interesting and fascinating time for that. Fascinating actually. Yeah. Well, thank you, Charles. This Can I just, yeah. oh, sorry, I just wanted to jump in and ask a question. Thank okay. you, just, last sorry, question. it's just like. Charles, do you have, do you have a minute <laughs> for this last question? It's just oh, this yeah. idea I, of the. We're going to 6.15, right? Hi, uh, Ibrahim, you can go. Really quick question, uh, because of that, um, thinking about the performance space and the kind of, uh, just uh, the access to culture and the opera was really fascinating. And I was just thinking, is there a way we can kind of, it's very speculative, like, design an experience of being in the theater in an opera 
while being at home, like, I don't know, do you design, like, you okay, turn off your lights now and mm-hmm. I, I don't know, we design like, like extension to our houses where your house is like an opera too, or I don't know, like, I, I just wanted to hear your kind of speculation on, on this. My, my partner is a concert pianist and, um, okay. and he gave a concert uh, on Sunday night um, that was completely professionally staged, managed, um, and we thought it would be perfect. And then I listened to it live, and it was awful. <laughs> I mean, it was awful. It, it, the, the, the recording equipment just buzzed and pissed and hit, and, and it sizzled. It was like, you know, um, so, and all, I've got a lot of friends in the performing arts, and they're all in the same boat. They cannot, there's no way this technology can transmit with any verisimilitude the sound that's being made by a performer. So there's a long way to go before technology kind of fall, c- catches up with our need to, to, to trans- transmit better. But I think it will. Uh, at some point, and even though I think we are going to be able to get back into a room together, as I said before, I think one of the great opportunities of now is we're going to develop technologies that that do what you just said, you know, that surround you with image and sound um, that, you know, you'll get add-ons to your computer that will translate, you know, um, signals that are come, come from different sites, there will be recording, um, you know, in-home recording uh, microphones that will be great and you'll, you know, be able to hear things beautifully. It does not happen now. It's very frustrating for performers. Um, but yes, I think that that's, that's, good. that's in the works. I mean, you guys should, all go, you should probably be thinking about all these different kinds of opportunities uh, of now. Um, keeping in mind that we've got to get back together. Uh, it's going to, it has to happen. So um, it too much of too much of our cultural well-being is based in being in togetherness. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Charles. I propose that everyone unmute and we have a big applause online uh, for Charles. Uh, I, I... Thank you all. Oh gosh, that did not Sorry. sound like a hall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, was muted, actually, yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. And uh, and uh, I hope to. I hope to. You all have good luck. Um, oops. Good luck uh, in your in your future endeavors, and um, you know I, we'll certainly uh, look for some of your resumes. We'll try to uh, 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 if we, if we're hiring, we'll definitely give it give them thoughts. So, with that, I'm going to say adieu. Thank Bye you, everyone. Charles. Amazing, really Thank good. You. Mm-hmm. And we have probably Ursula. Uh, is Ursula? Oh, I don't see you. Yes, we're here. Ah, yeah, and Stefan. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry we're kind of getting longer uh, in the calls, but uh, it's such a joy to see you. How are you? We are very well. How are you? We're very happy to welcome you. Uh, everyone knows uh, Ursula and Stefan Agency. They've been doing an amazing work that everyone's been following on borders and environmental uh, implications also of the construction and management of borders. They have a long trajectory and they are one of our uh, most uh, exciting and, and uh, uh, lively family members. So we're really happy to have this call with you. Thank you, thank you. Um, we, hi everyone. First of all, congratulations, right? I'm <laughs> graduating. Uh, everyone is saying this is a unique class. You're the first pandemic class. So that's something. Um, and we just prepared a few slides just to um, kind of share. Andres asked us to share our trajectory, how we launched our practice right after graduation and, and where we are now. So um, it'll be really quick. And then, uh, yeah, please just let us know if you have any thoughts or questions. All right. All right, can you all see full screen or what do you see on your end? 
Uh, we see presenter see mode, Ursula. Not not the full screen, but the other one, the one with the, all the slides. The thing with the slides. Is this better? Yeah. Yes, it is. Not full screen. Yeah. All right, so um, as Andres mentioned, we are agency and we live and work on the US-Mexico border. So we launched, uh, well, we graduated in 2006 um, and we started with the Kinney Travel Fellowship and that was a way for us to really kind of formulate our thoughts as, as practicing um, architects and designers in the world. So we took two years to work and um, obtain our licenses. And then in 2008, we decided to launch our practice right uh, in the middle of the economic crash, which is very similar to the current economic crash. Um, and so we thought Thought we can share this as a as a positive note for you guys that if you feel like financially things are unstable right now um, it can be done and it actually launched us in, in an amazing way and so in order to do that because we were practicing in sort of economic scarcity no one was really hiring architects at the time we then applied to every fellowship we could think of so do that right get there's a book out there that's called like architecture fellowships um, and we applied and entered every competition we just really wanted to kind of understand our place in the world but also be able to pay our bills um, and in order to do that so here here's a here's a collection of, of things we won so we were able to win the McDowell fellowship the foundation for the arts in New York the one prize and then the Rome prize and all of this craziness happened within one year and we just couldn't believe it um, and it's not because we we're any better than anyone else but it's we really think it's because we were really hungry uh, financially intellectually um, we just <laughs> Literally in all ways. So we, we graduated and we were just like left out of the GSAP family and we just didn't know what to do. Um, and so that kind of hunger translated and somehow all these institutions decided to support us. And so, but in order to do that, um, the, the goal was to create what we called our manual of practice. This was a 150 page document, um, a little sort of manifesto book that uh, essentially is the trajectory within which we wanted to practice. So we weren't just going to go after any kitchen renovation or any client. We really wanted to sort of understand what meant um, a lot to us. So this manual of practice, you see it, it looks like the chemistry table of elements, but it moves from uh, a gradient of uh, informal to formal environments and then scales that are from the globe down to the, the body and to particulate matter. And so within it, we were able to find um, whether each project we wanted to go after intersected and made sense in our manual of practice. And it's been 12 years now and we still follow it. Um, so in order to do that, we said, okay, so what is the world in which we're going to practice architecture? So we started to map the world. This is the sort of uh, the Dymaxion, you know, the J Bucky Fuller's unfolded map of the world. Um, and the idea was to truly only map uh, spaces of, of, um, of conflict and of scarcity. And we think this has a lot to do with when we launched our practice that we were drawn to this idea of conflict and scarcity because of the, the political and economic instability. So we mapped the migration and detention sites, um, waste and extraction sites, um, and uh, conflict and humanitarian aid. Uh, so this military conflict and humanitarian aid. And what we were realizing is that all of these kinds of um, like sort of really deep deeply rooted conflicts were overlapping and we realized that that's where that's the scale at which we wanted to practice but also to be able to zoom in to the scale of air or of dust molecules this is a scan of dust uh, uh binational dust in the region this is border dust um and so so that kind of manual of practice like i would suggest for all of you guys to take the next month after you graduate to say okay what is my role in the world and within what are the brackets within which i want to make i want to make a difference um and so some of the we were operating at the margins when we went to Rome when we want the Rome Prize, uh, we were there for a year and we were mapping and working with the Roma population in order to uncover institutionalized racism by the Italian government and how these people were always uh, pushed and relegated to the margins of the city. Um, and so this, these are mapping exercises of, of understanding the sort of the, the relocation of the Roma population. 
And then after that, we started teaching in St. Louis. This is right at, at uh, right when uh, Black, Li Black Lives Matter started to um, sort of become founded um, in St. Louis. And so here we are really interested at the evolution of the militarization of police and the absolute loss of basic civil rights that we have in public space. So, so images like this emerge where we are no longer allowed to protest peacefully. Um, and then to scale that up to sort of the, the globe, uh, we are looking at the, the militarization of urbanism. This is a, uh, a simulated uh, military urban environment that's meant to, for urban warfare training. And here at the scale, we're interested in understanding how the securocratic regimes or um, military industrial complex is uh, in essentially criminalizing urbanism and, and training how to penetrate it more. And so all of that, um, it's, it has, or most of this work, then we decided to collect it into a publication. So our book comes out very soon. Um, and this collects uh, all of the military urbanisms and their relationships to the developing world and to informality and understanding how um, the sort of the global and US military are always interested in, in controlling um, even uh, spaces of informality that are generally unpredictable. And so our work as architects and designers has been to collect taxonomies and typologies of these uh, fake built environments all over the world and the US and to expose them. So this will become a publicly available database for anyone um, to see through a sort of a GIS completely located sites to understand how the military is replicating a spaces of culture like uh, mosques and cemeteries um, and things like that. Um, and so I think that was a very fast kind of overview of the research and then Stephen will talk a little bit about, so what do we do, right? Like what do we do when we learn the world like this? How do we practice as designers? So a lot of the built work um, deals with trying to find an audience and trying to find a site and trying to find a, um, a, a point, kind of like a leverage point in order to inflect some of these situations. And oftentimes we find that uh, perhaps the smallest interventions can have the largest effects. Um, I think going back to, to how Ursula introduced uh, our, our practice that we, we started with this enormous institutional support, including fellowships with, with arts communities and artists and, and authors and, and all sorts of individuals outside the realm of architecture. We're always looking for, um, for ways to increase the kind of architectural public and to engage the public through, through architecture. So I think as we go, you might, if you're not familiar with our work, you might find uh, the, the question keeps coming up, like, is it architecture? And in what ways is it architecture? So, um, but the, the common themes, uh, I think, are that the projects have objections to make, that, that we, we take a stand, um, that they materialize themselves in objects that we either find and appropriate or objects that we design with um, our kind of sensitivities uh, to the conditions uh, in order to enact objectives. And so um, the projects always have a kind of um, advocacy component which is essential to, to how we wanted to practice and how we wanted to affect uh, the world through architecture. So um, this, this project is an example. Um, right when we moved to El Paso, we found um, that we had uh, an opportunity actually in the space, uh, in the space just behind uh, the school that we teach. We teach at Texas Tech College of Architecture in El Paso on the US-Mexico border. And there's this amazing uh, infrastructural canopy that had been underused. Um, and we were noticing sort of as we were traveling through the city that these objects, these, these traffic barrels were sort of um, directing uh, border communities in and out of the border uh, crossing every day. And so we decided to, to make an impact and, and, and sort of take them out of commission for uh, a night uh, while hanging them in this kind of parametric canopy. Uh, to really transform the space into an event space and to have this was really meant to generate dialogue So we invited a large public including our students, but also um, city officials to really think about ways to reconsider the kind of crafting of space in the borderland um, To imagine a kind of playful occupation as opposed to the, the kind of ordered occupation of the space and to really celebrate the the strange kind of juxtapositions um, That happen. So here's a student of ours. It was a costume party around Halloween to the same night. Student of ours really uh, becoming the kind of infrastructural um, system that we were, we were meant to critique. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in another way, so those were found objects sort of, um, you know, appropriating material that, that is of the city. Um, this is more of a fabrication project where we're interested in the ways in which we can, as architects, um, enact a large scale transformation of space and public opinion with kind of a minimal uh, use of material. And so this is a really lightweight uh, composite aluminum sheet. Um, a Luca bond or dye bond, as you guys probably know, uh, that, that we uh, CNC flip milled in order to assemble these kind of umbrella forms, creating a kind of um, armature for photography uh, as a way to engage, uh, this is our selfie wall, as a way to engage selfie culture in the ways in which um, the public is sort of constantly uploading uh, data to social media and online, data that can be scraped uh, with biometrics and facial recognition software. And so the armature was really also meant to uh, confuse uh, the, the biometrics and the facial recognition software by deploying shadows um, and, and uh, converting the light situations in order to see some of the, the factors there. Um, and this was tied to, so it wasn't only an architecture in the physical world, it was tied to a kind of architectural um, platform online in which uh, people that were at the, at the event were actually in dialogue with each other, each other through uh, hashtagging and aggregating some of these photos um, to a, a public, public um, website that was then commenting on the types of data that they were uh, sort of inadvertently releasing in public space. Um, this speaking last project. Huh? Speaking of data. Yeah, speaking of data. So this last, uh, I guess one of the last projects we'll show um, is more recent. And this is engaging the kind of uh, cross-border atmospherics of the borderland. Um, these are uh, dust sensors that we've placed in kind of hacked um, surveillance camera housings as a way to, to um, collectively draw across the border. This project, this part of this project is called Drawn Across Borders. Um, and so information, especially environmental information, sort of recognizes a hard border at the US-Mexico boundary and people, even though we ingest Mexican dust every day and Mexicans ingest American dust in the desert that we live in, um, we, we don't really understand the kinds of flows and transfers of this uh, pollutant or, or this, the kind of data that it, that it holds. Um, and so this was an exercise we, we kind of guerrilla installed, but also had some permission to install some sensors uh, in some sites uh, in Ciudad Juarez on the Mexican side and in El Paso on the US side, uh, where uh, we employed uh, the help of the public to kind of be stewards of these sensors um, and to have them uh, provide a kind of Wi-Fi connection in order to upload this data for these real-time visualizations. and. Uh, so these maps are basically real-time uh, environmental analysis based on wind flow data, um, looking at the trajectories of, of pollution so people can understand what areas they might be polluting from their one atomized sort of sensor location and, and what, uh, what areas uh, might be uh, polluting, uh, basically driving pollutants into their area through the wind. Um, so we've also, um, so back to this idea of being sort of nimble and flexible and finding many different avenues for, uh, for practice. Another sort of wing of our work is, is dealing with publications as a form of um, sort of democratizing data and sort of getting, getting the truth of the situations that we're, that we're interested in out. Um, so the Border Dispatches is a partnership with Architects Newspaper the past couple of years um, where we've looked at architectural and infrastructural transformations in the borderland um, that pose uh, potentially significant threats to public health uh, and, and uh, public space. Uh, so everything from, uh, we've uncovered the, the use of kind of simulated um, border fences for border uh, patrol training where they actually train to shoot across the wall, which isn't quite legal by international law standards, uh, to these kind of remote surveillance structures um, that manage the land when in the absence of any physical patrol. Um, to unpacking a bit of the privatization of the migrant detention complex and the, the various uh, conditions of uh, human rights offenses that might be perpetuated in that situation. All of that to say, um, uh, this work has, has drawn, uh, has garnered the attention um, of some, some NGOs who, who then now use us as, as sort of quasi-architectural consultants um, or urban analytical, spatial analytical consultants to better understand um, sort of their 
uh, their issues that they're, they're dealing with. And so Amnesty International recently approached us to, to look at, um, in, in light of recent um, COVID uh, cases in, in migrant detention centers, to sort of unpack um, the ownership models and the actual physical locations of a variety of uh, detention centers across the US. So we use our tools, which I'm sure you know, you guys have, have mastered over the last several months um, to, to kind of data scrape and aggregate um, in, in kind of uh, compiled spatial and visual graphics to, to then put this online to make this kind of radically public so everybody can know what detention center is in their backyard and also to know um, the kind of relative, uh, the relative population density within each of these environments as COVID um, over the next several months will surely, uh, COVID cases will continue to increase and jeopardize the health of individuals here. Um, so this map is actually live online right now and you can zoom in and understand whether it's run by for profit by private companies or it's federal um, and up to the right you see that if you zoom in enough you actually see the architectural spaces or the buildings um, through the, the aerial imagery that we've overlaid um, and so we're going to continue to build on this as an idea of understanding these spaces of, of detention that now are becoming um, spaces of death. Um, and we're also finding other avenues uh, for work. So uh, we've recently launched a research center as part of the Texas Tech College of Architecture satellite here that should be called POST, uh, Project for Operative Spatial Technologies, uh, which is looking at uh, the use of emerging technologies from the fields of uh, surveillance, remote sensing, environmental sensing, et cetera, in order to better understand uh, what we call a data divide between the US and Mexico boundary. Um, we saw some of this work in the previous environmental sort of study. Um, but this, this platform is meant to then now be a node and a larger network of researchers and available, sort of radically publicly available um, to um, Sorry, count, county and city officials and architects and urbanists uh, sort of traveling uh, to the border. Um, so we're launching uh, a even larger initiative called the Border Consortium for Actionable Spatial Research, which aggregates um, uh, both U.S. and Mexican, largely architectural um, spatial practitioners and educators and researchers uh, who are either uh, who either have a, a border city or border condition as a site of study or as uh, as a location for where they live and work. Um, we're developing a platform for kind of shared um, uh, shared data transfer and and shared sort of projects to happen. So stay tuned to that. Um, and yeah, I think full circle, we were so happy to be invited back to, uh, to GSAP this last year as part of the Incubator Prize. Um, we've been developing ideas about um, uh, combating conditions of, of UV radiation in the borderland um, as a major threat to public health and as a kind of architectural problem in which uh, architects typically design for shade, but they don't necessarily design to combat the effects of radiation within conditions of apparent shade, um, which actually is really harmful to, to uh, the bodies and the people of the borderland. Um, and so we're developing um, shared uh, tools, tool sets, uh, visualization and modeling tools in order to understand this as a design condition and then prototyping actual design responses uh, in partnership with some of our um, city um, city arts districts and uh, city government. And the, and the way this connects to the overall work here on the border is that we're finding out more and more that uh, migrant bodies are generally subjected to a lot more UV radiation and damage, whereas the surveillance mechanisms or border patrol agents are um, constantly making more and more shade available to themselves and to equipment. So they will shade and protect cameras before they protect migrant uh, humans. And so, so we're kind of looking at the disparities um, there as well. And, uh, so we really look at sort of the architecture of policy and the architecture architecture as policy. Um, part, of the, part of the reason we named our firm agency to be sort of simultaneously bureaucratic and right, right. <laughs> design oriented. Well, you see here like all these handles, like being nimble and flexible because we've um, sort of been constantly moving and following our sites and following our research interests. 
and being lucky enough to be in academia where we can actually afford to to develop this research that's not necessarily client based. Um, but we, I would, I think our advice would be to just be flexible and nimble and expand the boundaries at which you think a designer or an architect uh, might be operating. Well, this is amazing, really, really uh, incredible practice and so much inventive in the way that uh, you're emerging as architects. I'm sure there's so many questions, but meanwhile, I mean, I, I would propose anyone either jump in as soon as possible because we, we have to go really fast, but also to, you, there's the possibility of writing in the chat. And, uh, but I, I, I'm really, uh, there's something that I really love of your practice is that, and the way you explain it today, I, I think it was totally making sense, that is basically that it all started with objections. So whereas we think that architectural, as basically as actors, we're very kind of, we have to be very kind of welcoming whatever uh, we're commissioned, uh, your position is really different. You start basically by objecting and finding the funding, the situation, the basically building up the whole situation in which your work can develop. And I think this is crucial at this point, not only because of the kind of the uncertainty about markets or things like that, but because the world is going through a process of, of transformation that really needs voices and needs kind of a civil society that is active and architecture has. So maybe you can develop on this because I think it's a crucial part of your, of your practice. Right, yeah, and I think, um, well, I, we never think within, within architectural practice or discipline um, to begin with. And so uh, when, when we're faced with specific issues of scarcity or inequality or migration, just everything that's happening in the world right now, um, what, what seems to make sense for us is to first construct the database first construct the map, right? Like whether it is a, a physical, a, a map as we understand it, or a map of characters, or of players, or of policies, and truly understand the, the button that we need to press in order to undo or to object, right? Um, and so some of the built projects end up being really small, and, and we like that because we can build them ourselves, but they really, there is just that, that one lever or that one button that they press that completely sort of connects to the much larger global issues. Um, and I think that was also part of our education when we were at GSAP uh, with Jeffrey Naba. He had just come out of sort of like the um, AMO research lab. And he was saying, listen, all you need to do is just like spend 20 minutes, like throw yourself into research mode on the internet and then be able to kind of sort of find the moment where you think you make sense and build the context. And then with that, within that context and the objection makes sense. Um, so that's kind of how we've been operating since school. Mm -hmm. This is really a follow-up to your question, but uh, Matthew typed it in the chat, um, or the, to what you were just saying. Um, how has your manifesto evolved over time? Like, have you made changes to that original book? What exactly, you know, like, where, where are the sort of, like, differences that you see? Right. Yeah, it has, has changed a lot because we've grown um, a lot, but at first the manifesto was really looking at um, the spatial manifestation of inequality. And so we were looking at informality, what are, might be called slums or favelas and these kinds of spaces. And then with, uh, with the years, we've been able to zoom further and further out and understand that we're clearly not trained to be humanitarian aid workers or, or doctors and things like that. So we can't really intervene in these spaces without totally making a mess. So as we're zooming out, we've, we've actually realized that the powers that control those kinds of environments um, at the decision-making table, like that's where we actually need to intervene to kind of amplify the, the reach of our work. Um, and so in that sense, I would say we've essentially zoomed out and not necessarily only looked at the, the architectural and urban manifestations of the conditions, but looked at policy and surveillance and military and all of the incredibly powerful um, people who actually are structures that actually make these spaces such or, or you know that force people to live in these kinds of environments so I, maybe that comes with maturity and gray hair i don't know but um that's you know we've just like continued to zoom out further and further yeah we've also found the need um or at least anyway had better experiences now now that we've sort of moved our practice to be more based in a location in which we 
hope to act and transform. And so um, for a while, uh, you know, our practice has been, has been moving around a bit uh, from New York to Rome to St. Louis and now El Paso. And El Paso, um, not that it's the only place uh, that we can practice, but it's, it's been really productive in that the, the actual site of the work is, um, is the subject of the work and the subject is the site, right? There's, it, it's no longer um, sort of at arm's length. And um, the experience that we were fortunate enough to have in Rome, which was the first sort of test case of actually living, living the research, right? Actually being in these communities and, and talking to people on the ground and trying things out and seeing all the, all the inevitable failures of, of certain interventions and then working through, um, that really, that really, changed our perspective from our initial manifesto in which we thought we could sort of abstractly sort of analyze and suggest interventions to um, to a practice now which is much more um, sort of in conversation with the place that it is through the projects right like we're we're as interested in the response to the project as the delivery of the project um, in the context that we're in currently and I think that's been that's been really productive. <coughs> Well, Ursula and Stefan, thank you so much. It's been really, really great to see your work and also understand what it, the, the huge potential of architecture that you're showing, like the huge potential of becoming really a player in, in, in really important things that are happening and that architecture can really help to, to make them evolve differently. Thank you so much. I, let's see if now can people can unmute and, and applause. I'm, I think that you totally deserve a big applause. So let's see that. I, I promise it'll never work, Andre. It's, it's not, yeah, yeah, just, not possible. But these are yeah. good trailer. <laughs> Here, this is what I have for you. Yeah. Wow, excellent. Good. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, Write your manifesto, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> See you, I'm really happy to see you here. Uh, we, we met a couple of years ago and we had such a, a number of exciting conversations. Uh, your practice keeps uh, growing and, and gaining importance. Uh, you, uh, it's, you're very well known, RSAA uh, is, a, is a firm also that is expanding uh, its uh, alliances internationally. Uh, and you also were in GSAB in the UD program and uh, graduating. And it, it, we're really happy to have you uh, talking to all of us today at the moment that people will be uh, graduating in a couple of days and uh, were so many uh, emotions, but also let's say plans are being made and your voice, your experience, your, your insight uh, will be super uh, useful, I'm sure for everyone. So. Uh, welcome and, and super happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Andrews. Um, yeah, it's, it's my great honor to, to share something uh, uh, which we did in the last few years. And also, I think I follow up the whole conversation, you know, uh, last one, uh, Charles, and uh, especially Charles talking about a lot of uh, the, the things after the, the corona uh, issues. And uh, uh, right now, we base, we're mainly based in China. Uh, I just opened up uh, my, my new office in Berlin. Uh, during the uh, how to say the, the, the beginning phase of the virus issues in, in China, uh, at that moment, the Europe in Europe in United States, everyone was was safe. Uh, so I was actually spent my first months actually not in China because at that moment, no one is working in China. They all stay at home and uh, no project and uh, every, everything is just ceased. So um, that was very interesting experience. Uh, we were talking about. What's going on if Europe in, in Berlin, if that happened? Uh, and no one believed that. And then uh, after uh, we went back two weeks, actually, two weeks later, um, you know, uh, in Berlin, my office started to, you know, uh, also stay at home and they work at home. Uh, even in Beijing, uh, in, I have two offices in Shanghai uh, and Beijing in China. So uh, basically the Shanghai office was, was quite, quite okay. Um, they start to work, uh, I think, just uh, early February uh, without any, you know, problem. But in Beijing, because, you know, in China, it's more political oriented. So that uh, we actually 
only half of the workers, uh, uh, you know, the, the labor force uh, uh, being used uh, in the last two or three months until three weeks ago, we start to work normally. And today we feel very, just the same as last year. You know, the, the, I think for, for our part, the market is totally recovered. Uh, somehow we feel that like that. But uh, thank you for your introduction that, um, uh, but I think still, I think for uh, most of the, maybe some of the Chinese students, uh, we are more familiar, but uh, I think for a lot of uh, uh, the other alumni uh, and also non-Chinese, uh, maybe we, some of the practice they saw online, but not, not too many. So uh, I think also the case, I'm a Chinese student, was educated in China and UK, and United States and I worked for, um, you know, in, in New York for a few years and went back to China, worked with a, with some a bunch of Germans, uh, but, you know, it's more like independent office later. So I think this experience could be interesting or, or I don't know if it's helpful, but we, we like to share some of the, the stuff. Maybe I, I have also a really small uh, presentation. If you saw that, uh, you can see that. We can see it, but it's in presentation. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, this is a basic presentation I made for the uh, uh, AIA lecture, uh, talking about also something similar about young architects and career, even I'm uh, this year 36, 37. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I'm considering, you know, in, in architecture society, this is a, a still quite, quite young age. Um, so after graduating 13 years, this is some, some quick through, you know, this is what I did in China for, uh, in 2003, so almost 20 years ago. A um, lot of Chinese students might be interested or, or familiar with, with this, uh, this kind of format. Really, let's say, um, uh, traditional, but, you know, it's a big change after I exchanged in UK. Uh, so basically, that was a little bit closer what what we do uh, recently but that's uh, you know not really common in China so that's why I I start to uh, go abroad and study uh, but this is some first try you know to try some some little bit interesting stuff and this is a very Columbia uh, GSEP oriented uh, form what we did let's say uh, 14 15 years ago uh, and this is what we did in UD program, very, um, how does it say, systematic urban design. But this is a very interesting, um, the UD stuff we learned uh, uh, at that moment in China, even when we went back to China, you know, no one understand what we're doing uh, because it's FAR zero in China. If you talk about urban design, it's basically like master planning um, buildings about a lot of mass uh, produced uh, uh, urban design that that's what we um, what we do recent uh, let's say uh, five years later after we we uh, we started practice in China but not not too much right now because uh, in China the market is it's, it's getting the same like in Beijing and Shanghai is the same as uh, New York and uh, San Francisco and people talk about FAR zero talking about some really light acupunctural um, style, you know, um, urban design, but this is a, this is another competition just right after graduation. I did, uh, the competition with, uh, one of my AAD, um, fellow. Uh, so we win the second prize. This is some, some, something we try to combine what I learned as urban design, urban designer and in UD program. And also I'm quite interested of, uh, what AAD did, you know, so we, we, we did together, uh, right now they are also two AAD guys work for me in Shanghai office, uh, Zheng Dongqi from Tsinghua and Ye Yang from Southeast University. They all from AAD 09, uh, so two, two years later than me, but uh, we worked together quite well. And, uh, you know, especially Zheng Dong has been worked for me for five years. So uh, we set up a lot of interesting stuff in the past five years. And uh, Ye Yang was just left Mushi Safdi uh, because he, he was the, uh, project manager for this uh, uh, Chongqing big boat building, you know, this big boat floating building. Uh, uh, and so he joined us, uh, I think in this March. So quite interesting. So then I joined Cesar Pelli, but I, I personally was not a big fan of um, Pelli's architecture style, but I think it's a really good uh, experience for me to 
to learn how to operate an office and not really big scale uh, office. This is our New York office. I work for Raphael Petty actually. Sorry, uh, do you, um, sorry, so sorry to interrupt, but I think yeah. your presentation may be frozen on the first slide. Are we supposed to see a different image? Oh, okay. Sorry about so, that. Maybe, I hope it's not the Chinese firewall. <laughs> Uh, let me let me retry that again. Um, maybe this is better. I just leave that in uh, in this format so that uh, sure. you can see the slides. Oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, the, the Chinese stuff are talking about learn in uh, China and UK and uh, UD program uh, AAD. So uh, yeah, the, the uh, competition. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and also very interesting, uh, in, in Pali office, the, uh, I mean, especially in New York office, it's quite compact size and the working flow, uh, everyone is basically working very independently. So basically the format um, I learned is exactly what we have in, Be in our Beijing office. Even now, I, I mean, uh, in my Beijing office, there are 30 people and in, uh, in Shanghai office, 12. So basically, it's it's a little bit a little bit bigger than uh, Pelly New York office right now. But the basic format I, I learned from uh, the you know the, the experience in Pelly. Uh, at the later phase of my Pelly experience, I I, I start to uh, we start to do competitions in China. So you can see this library and performing art center. But mostly, you know, in the first three years, we just you know the, the main work is building towers for New York. Uh, Mountain Sinai and uh, uh, 15 Penn Plaza, but you know, uh, this one's built, uh, uh, this one was not there forever. Uh, but very interesting in Pelly office, we, we did a competition for a master planning, and this master planning is basically laterally done by my current office, the RSAA. But RSA is not, not the same like GMP or HOK, they are. Um, they are not a very strong core uh, working method as a team, but more like a collection of different independent studios. So right now you see the logo we use is RSA, but basically it's Bureau of so Drawing, it's basically my own studio. So I'm talking Berlin, Shanghai, Beijing, they all work for me. Um, so basically that's like working flow uh, as, as independent, uh, very independent individual uh, personality. Uh, but at the beginning, we don't have any personality. When I joined the office, I was young kid, six, uh, 26 years old. So at, also at the beginning, those guys in Germany, they only have experience of uh, big master planning, uh, you know, project experience. They don't have too many um, building experience. Uh, not, 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 not saying, but the, the model like China, if you talk about the building, it's usually at that time, it's definitely more than 50,000 square meters. So that, uh, you know, so this is early stuff. This is the, actually the first, um, how to say, winning project we, we did. Uh, and uh, when I joined the office, a big contract, uh, it's more than like, uh, I think it's more than 2 million US dollars the contract. So uh, as a young kid, 27 years old, I signed a contract. Uh, uh, was, was, was quite surprised for myself and everyone because um, I think at that moment, the market was so good and then you just need to, uh, do a little bit interesting, good quality of design, uh, and you have a good chance. Then, then you can, you can, you can get it. Until now, we never signed a single contract as as big as this one so far. Uh, so very, very. I was, I was in a state. This was a south a northern station, high speed railway station area, and uh, in Qingdao, I was in a station last week. Um, it, the project was pending for eight years. I was surprised, but uh, um, that that was because of some political issues, but. Um, so, but I find out the problem uh, uh, when, when I run office for two years, um, when we always do the urban design, because we find out, you know, uh, the people doesn't really, because the urban design in China is like you run for two months and you, you, you stop and you, you, you run, you keep running. But in between, if you don't have some smaller things, you don't have bigger project, then people just has nothing to do and they wait for net, another big urban design project and they run. So I, I talk with my colleagues and, you know, maybe we need to do some competitions. I'm, I'm personally still interested of uh, architecture. So 
uh, also I educated uh, you know, from architecture backgrounds, uh, undergraduates. So um, I told them maybe we need to do competitions. So this is the first competition we win. Uh, it took eight years to build. So it was only finished last year, uh, number four high school in Tianjin. Uh, but you can see this is still quite German style and, uh, you know, really rational and all these kind of, but for example, some floating gestures and this kind of element we always use, they are still kept in our recent project. Um, so in that pace, every year we, we win like big competitions once a year, probably in 2003, uh, so 2013, 14, 15. So this is another one we, in, we win in 14. Um, we did the... Uh, uh, Mass Art Center and uh, Mario Bota, uh, Nishizawa, uh, and also He Jintang is one of the most renowned old Chinese architects. So this is more like cluster of cultural buildings, but we did the home as a plan, urban design. So that's some something we uh, we gained experience in the in the past, let's say three years, uh, from 2010 to 2014. But we also win one big building project. So this one was built up, but uh, you know this is also like a Highland Park. We build a base, so the base can overlooking the uh, the lake and also have some certain kind of service function in it. So uh, was was also quite long project. This is a, a hotel, actually high high luxury collection uh, uh, series uh, in Nanjing. So that was in 2015. So every year. And we start to do interior design with uh, Jaya and, and some other renowned interior designers. So, so right now, uh, the project will work on mostly 90%, including architecture and interior. Um, where the tricky thing in China is, they have a national standard for, have a, a limitation for architecture projects, but there's no limitation for interior design fee. And interior design fee, uh, almost 10 times than architecture design fee in China. So. Um, that can balance out certain, you know, uh, budget for the office. But, you know, after this kind of whole series of things, uh, series of things we, we think about, uh, you know, we, maybe we need certain identity to finding out, you know, if this is a, not only RSAA, but something in my own studio as a practice in China, what, what we can find out. Uh, but, you know, architects at the beginning phase, uh, they don't have they don't have too many when they don't have too many projects uh, they, they do something for for themselves I, uh, this is my my office in Beijing uh, it's a it's a yard next to drum and bell tower so that we renovate that uh, and it became a really famous uh, tourist attraction site actually yesterday I even had a, a, a advertisement shooting for for Dell uh, a, a new workstation series and on this uh, space and everyone was shocked by uh, how beautiful that looks like uh, especially at night you know uh, but today the time is really short maybe I can show you something uh, of, of those videos uh, very interesting but but the same thing you know as a as a fabric uh, as, a, as a renovation um, if we we just do that in a Chinese way renovate a Chinese yard it's not interesting so we're thinking about what we learned uh, as, as architect practice and uh, you know as a, as a kind of typological evolutionary mapping, uh, you know, method. So, uh, what we can do for the Chinese roof, for example. So basically, we made a roof as a, as a public as a, as a more like a public space and a gathering space for for the whole office. So basically, we had a lot of events, barbecues, and parties. Um, also, put in new materials and different layers and renovate the project. So, this inspired a lot of people to think about, you know, how. Um, you know how a Chinese yard can be can be done, but but not only in that way. But you know this is a also a very interesting not re, not realized project. But uh, only even last week um, the the Sinark, one of the biggest Chinese developer, they start to build this one. Uh, we we start to talk about build this one in, in Shandong, one of the project sites because they saw this one and they they, they want to build a church. So they said this is great, and then uh, we went to the site. So they 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 would like to pay, but this was. Some kind of competition we, we did uh, in uh, in 2014, 15. Yeah. So at that time, you know, we don't have too many interesting projects. And when the project was very big or urban design project, um, I'm thinking about you know maybe we can collect something as as a, as a own own identity or own practice and, and finding out some a little bit different prototype for the office. So basically, 
every year we have a certain budget like about half a million that, that that's actually actually the let's say 80 percent of the profit we can gain uh, each each year uh, at that moment so that was a big effort we but we don't know what this end up to but we just want to try something so that um, you know finding prototype for this pure church space and uh, also we did a international competitions but we know we're never going to win this one we actually break up the, the rule a little bit putting this cutting off box in in the water but all these kind of trying things uh, uh, I think at that moment we don't see any hope or we don't see any result but right at, at now I'm, I'm sitting there and talking about this all these kind of things we we have way we have certain way to reuse them or putting even the same project the or client like and then uh, to be realized um, so keep moving of this finding prototype and uh, basic prototype method we did uh, actually a, a small uh, project for a TV show uh, so basically in this one we also finding out very interesting prototype for a Chinese traditional yard interior in uh, exterior but also finding that uh, potential for Linking to the multiple perspective and narr narration, narrative uh, uh, feature for the ch for the Chinese painting in a certain way, finding out stories in in a long elevation. But actually, that one has been prolonged uh, as a Chinese scroll. So that was the project uh, built up in the last two years, uh, finding more section possibilities and uh, and build up something bigger. Uh, this is uh, actually a resort uh, with thirty. Uh, room hotel rooms, but with uh, uh, can, uh, with a restaurant and, and, and spa and a uh, lot of functions in in Chengdu. But you can see uh, these kind of things. We use the local material and uh, uh, so very vernacular looking. Uh, and VUE Resort, another one we did last year. So basically, uh, this evolutionary map mapping or what has this how to say uh, uh, evolutionary path they keep going. So but you know they look similar. But every step we move forward, we we have some kind of interesting result finding out, and this is actually quite uh, accept acceptable by the Chinese market. Uh, 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 you know the client was really really happy because you know they feel that you know this is some interior we also together and very uh, very interesting. This whole project from design to construction, architecture, and interior we spent actually five months. Uh, from last March to uh, uh, let's say uh, September and everything finished. So this is phase one and phase two they will s start another part of the hotel rooms. So actually you can see this, this evolutionary process uh, of our project. So uh, and also we have even more. So this is more like uh, you can see from the beginning of uh, this German style thing and we, we start to find it our own identity and step by step uh, even when last time, Andreas, uh, you, you, you were in um, China, we don't have so many. That was uh, three years ago, and we only have this tuning uh, recluse, this small one, some, some big, huge building. And this is some recent project under construction in Guangzhou and in Chengdu. They're all uh, going to be built up really quick this year. Let's say this October, these two buildings will be finished. Uh, UCCA. So really quick, I know the time is running out, um, but... Buy on, buy on tree hotels and you know this is just more following the the past but still at a certain phase we we try to re-identify you know what we're doing for example talking about the prototype different of of this guy and this guy you see especially the gallery how this is different from the the guggenheim prototype uh, and also different viewports and in the chinese way uh, talking about this uh, horizontal expression of uh, narration also, last year we did uh, quite a lot of installations because um, it's about the pace. Uh, maybe this is some another topic, but uh, uh, because in 2007 we start to see the you know the, this big uh, the big jump of the office and a lot of projects. But in 2018 uh, we didn't have too many projects to be built up because we we see the architecture still as a very traditional old uh, production. The production time to build uh, takes one or five to five to 10 years. Um, so basically we try to build up some something smaller. So you see the project we built up at the beginning, they were huge. They were like half million square meters 
uh, 100,000 square meters. And now the project we're working on are mostly around 5,000 to uh, 50,000 square meters, still quite big scale in, uh, in Europe and in the United States, but they are small scale in China. Uh, so in this case, the production time or the, to produce the production, let's say the first uh, high school project we built takes eight years. And recent projects, they're either one year, even half a year, we build up a new project so that um, this is a practice we have a very strong feedback. But in 2018 or 1918, we don't have too many things was be built. So that uh, we think about maybe we do installations that will be quicker speed. So this was, um, also this one was very interesting. Uh, this one when uh, it's called a cloud maze and when actually the, the what, uh, WF, World Architectural Festival, uh, the installation, the, 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 the the year uh, uh, I'm in the final winner of the installation. So talking about some oriental feeling, uh, this one did even have a second generation. We did that in uh, actually one week for uh, one of the artist's friend for myself. Uh, and a really low budget, 20,000 uh, US dollars. Oh uh, no, actually it's 2,000 US dollars. An installation for uh, the Nest Cafe, uh, but more like a, more like a, a interior design, but uh, together with uh, urban renovation, but really quick in one week construction phase, but um, quite good result. Uh, we also, you know, the same kind of things for practicing in interior and also for my, um, some, uh, this, this is my teaching production in, as a visiting professor in Tianjin University, uh, but quite similar, quite similar idea of, you know, creating different prototype and clusters and multi-perspective Chinese views and uh, different functions. We also did a uh, very uh, lot of, uh, let's say, how to say in, in, in two-dimensional, uh, how to say two-dimensional graphic. This is a, you know, Japanese cartoon style uh, uh, graphic, but I think it's, it's very interesting because uh, even you see some, uh, you know, luxury branding, Louis Vuitton, they, they start to, uh, all, the, whole, the whole market is shifting to this two-dimensional graphic style uh, word. As architect, of course, you do good good architecture but architecture is not only about the building but you know it, it expands to 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 every corner of your life so um you know for example we we made this one for our restaurant you see that this restaurant was one of the most <clears throat> popular restaurants in xi'an but xi'an was the you know really asian dynasty uh capital for china so i want to see a dragon flowing above so that you will just put it there but you, you can't do that in, in your architectural design but maybe later you have a goggle for AR, VR, then you, you, you're eating and you talk with the dragon. That's something, as some kind of expansion of the imagination of as an architect, but I think spatial experience is really, really important. You know, we're talking about Chinese style or Chinese um, feature, but I think it's, it's universal. It's not only about China because uh, it's consuming time, consuming market. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit doubted how, how that goes later after the, 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 you know, the, the current coronavirus issues, but uh, I, I see the Chinese market is recovering and uh, I think still as an architect, the approach is always the same. You, you use the same kind of approach to achieve your goal. Um, it, not, not necessarily in a, in a traditional architectural way, but still uh, I think there are multiple ways as architect we can do. Uh, yeah, but I, I think so we talk about, you know, the whole presentation was talk, uh, talking about Chinese form, Chinese narration, but I think it's not nothing about, nothing about, only about China, but about a lot of things we can, we can, we can see as a uh, young practice, you know, uh, less than 10 years, what we did in the, in the last 10 years after we went back to China. Thank you. This is amazing, uh, amazing presentation. So, so many things to discuss. I'm sure there will be questions emerging uh, meanwhile, uh, I, I would like to ask you something very particular. What, what is that that you, you would advise uh, people that are graduating, the, all of us that are here? I mean, because your, your career, the first moments were really rich. Like you were collaborating with others, you were building up partnerships, you were uh, operating in different countries. What is that that overall you would take uh, out of all that experience that you would convey to others? Uh... I think a lot of things happen to us very random in a random way, but uh, we don't we don't even plan uh, what we got right now uh, because I, I still see uh, architectural practice uh, as a as a very old uh, probably the oldest 
industry in, in, in now compared to IT, compared to the other industry. It's still a long term for, for practice. But how to compress that is, I think, something right we did, especially you know, facing the Chinese market, facing different situations. Uh, but um, I wasn't expect I, I, I even do a practice myself. I know the risk, I know how hard that is. Uh, but when I joined the office, uh, we have, uh, I have a German uh, collaborator who is uh, the general manager and he, he do business and uh, I, I just focus on design work. That's something I, I was looking for. But later I find out uh, if you want to do your own practices, it's not enough. Uh, it's about, it's, the whole thing is about star, storytelling. Um, if you don't have your own identity, your, your own story, uh, it's never going to be possible to be happen. I'm talking about self practice, but uh, if if you work for someone else, I think um, the the methodology is quite clear. Then that's a very different thing. Uh, for me, as you said, it's it's somehow in between. At the beginning, I wasn't I wasn't uh, you know try to find out something myself. I, it's 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 the uh, in the process I find out you know when we talk about yeah we're German office we're RSA, no one knows what's the difference from this guy and, and the other guy as a GMP and uh, or as, as HPP or, or S1. So, uh, but those offices are much better than you in, in the way, in the track you try to find out. Then I, I tell my partners, this is not the way you are, you are not as good as them in, in the track you, you're looking for. So um, we are collect, like more like collections of small offices. Your personal identity is more important. So, but I don't know what's my personal identity, but I know what I'm interested. In. So, you know, like the way we were in Gen Y Soho, this uh, same as New York, the CBD area. I'm still living here as a CBD area. Uh, but, you know, as office, I think that doesn't inspire my, me too much. You know, we, I want to move into the, 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 the old city in Beijing. That's why you stay in Beijing, right? So then, um, you know, every action we did is actually not the choose of in a certain target, but actually that, uh, that gave us a certain track to find out uh, who we are. You know, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's the track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is one question. Are there distinct, distinctions in professional opportunity and growth between Chinese and non-Chinese architects practicing in China these days? Uh, that's a very interesting topic. I think uh, the market is getting very diverse. Uh, but I think every every how to say every generation has its own chance. Mm -hmm. um, I I talk with uh, Yan Song Ma, for example, from MAD a lot about their practice. I, I see very different opportunities. Uh, at that moment, no one know what is parametric design, what is you know this kind of really fancy curved form, and uh, so he just need to do one thing, and then he he will be success as long as he insists this and then going to the end. Uh, of course, he has a lot of, uh, you know, deeper thoughts about those. Uh, in our time, uh, the chance is passed, but you know, what is, what's the, what is the thing? Um, uh, for the new generation, I've been talking with, for example, Bo Yuan Jiang, uh, one of the uh, IMR guy, um, very good, very good uh, uh, alumni from GSAP um, and, and some younger GSAP, uh, friends and uh, I see there, it's really hard for them to get into the, um, let's say, a big, big building, mar uh, let's say, larger scale building market, let's say this way. Uh, because uh, I think not only in China, but also even in, in, in Germany, in United States, if you don't have a, a really good portfolio, uh, you don't have a solid experience, you, you don't really get a chance because, I mean, it's a big risk for the client. Uh, I think even in, let's say, go back to 15 years ago, 30 years ago even, uh, the chance is getting smaller and smaller, uh, not only in China, but, but globally. For example, if we want to do some uh, bigger project, we, we have projects, my own office in, in Germany, uh, my, my own studio, but if we want to do a same kind of scale project in Europe, we still, I think, I assume it takes me maybe another five years to get there. But you know, because, because they want to see your portfolio in Europe. We don't have, it's all in China. So uh, it's the same situation for the new generation. But however, in China, they see this diversity happening. 
uh, and then they are breaking up the markets and before was totally owned by the national owned big design De institute and now um, there are many many small offices they have their own position uh, but mostly interior designs and uh, uh, maybe some installations so the time is still quite quite um, quite good and tough uh, they don't have uh, very rich uh, project resource like us but, but they I think they can survive and they they can also offer very unique uh, vision to the market and I think it's only about time right it's about time and but I see the generation is compressed for example if uh, if you say uh, you see the um, how or practice coming out from the market from MAD that that takes about maybe eight years seven years but next generation to to catch up maybe only takes three years and next generation even faster and faster so the whole thing is compact so last week they have a really interesting talk about new generations I I, I, uh, I was listening that Yen Song Man talking with some other uh, architects uh, he said for him the 80s 70s and the 90s they are the same generation that I agree because uh, basically it's very similar thought uh, it's it's all about your vision how to look at the, uh, the, the society in China the, the 60s I think they are they are quite different, but uh, I think the later generations are, are compressed. You know, they 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 have similar vision and uh, they are in the same track. But then I think, of course, in that in that chance, uh, um, if you're younger architects, you get less chance. One final question uh, uh, that that uh, Jesse uh, uh, raised: uh, How was the interaction with clients? How has things, the interaction with clients changed in the past 10 years, private, public, institutional? You have a broad experience with different clients. How, how do you see this relationship changing in the last 10 years? I see very different. When I work in New York, my client is like, for example, Steve Ross and 60 years old, you know, uh, uh, Go back to China, the, the client was from 50 to 40 years old. Now they're even older. Uh, now my clients mostly the same age as myself, around 40, uh, even younger, some uh, 10 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. So they, I think that's, that's exactly the chance. You know, the new generation are so different from the from, from old one. There, there's a big jump, especially from 80s or 90s, the, the, the generation in China. Um, I also see that globally. So I don't know what's the market situation in, in New York. Uh, in, in Europe, we start to talk, talk with some uh, very young clients. Uh, so, so that changed the whole, the, the whole methodology and method, uh, not only about how you approach the project, but also about finding identity of the projects and then how to you know, throw after the production, how to drop this to the, to the market. Not only the client, but also the users. You know, for example, uh, all those pop, uh, projects we did in China are, are really popular because uh, it offers very interesting uh, views of you know perspective for for you know whole new thinking of the space. But it looks Chinese, but but no one tells why. But you know that's that's the thing we talk about. And the, the old generation uh, they understand, but I think they are not so sensitive. They don't take too much sci-fi, for example. So you know it's about image. But I'm not saying about image driven is it's the right thing, but it's one part of the identity or one part of the character of, of uh, uh, an architecture design. So I think that 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 is you know uh, in, in everywhere in the world is, is getting there. And, um, it's very interesting, uh, and of course in installation is another way to make offering a more pure experience for for that. That's why we 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 did so many installations last year. Well, see you. This has been amazing. It's really energizing talking to you and see all the activity and the beautiful projects that you're developing and the way that you're thinking of the evolution of the context. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I don't know, we, we, the clapping thing, the applause <laughs> is not working, but maybe Lila, we have the recorded one. Uh, but it's been an amazing session. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And let's keep talking very soon. In, in two days on Saturday, you have your big day. So you need to relax and prepare for it. And we will be following.
and we'll keep connected uh, with, with CUA, with everyone here as part of this large GSAP community uh, that we share, share sensitivities. We understand what uh, 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 we, we mean when we say typologies and, and we, we, that is really a language that, that we, we, we're part of. Uh, thank you very much for this amazing conversation. So we keep talking on Saturday with all everyone and with all our friends internationally.